Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. And you're listening to A Bite Of, where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. And in this case, the first of three nipples. The eighth nibble of X-Men 97. Of the finale, the three-part finale. Oh, I just meant as in a total. I know. Yeah. But it, we're, we're here. <sighs> Toward the end. I feel like the a three part finale is it can only get worse from here. Yeah. <laughs> it's the X-Men. Which scares me. <laughs> Before we get into dissecting, talking about this one of three finale before the penultimate episode, make sure you're following us, subscribing to us, throwing some stars our way, doing all those fun things that you normally do with a podcast or a show that you really like. On Patreon this month, we are continuing our Before You Watch, or Before the MCU. We have another episode of Before You Watch. Um, so Before the MCU, we are doing the X-Men 2000 movies, one through three. Think of this as a road to Deadpool and Wolverine. I feel like with those movies, people love them slash hate them. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. But- Sure. <laughs> I have lots of feelings, but it's going to be exciting to revisit those movies. It's going to be interesting. So it gave us the uh, 20 years plus of uh, Hugh Jackman Wolverine. So, and he's be, still going yeah. in 2024. He's still going. So that's all on Patreon. Um, yeah, spoiler. Spoiler alert. I had uh, lots of X-Men 97 spoilers. All eight episodes. X-Men as a whole. Life. <laughs> Let us officially take a bite of X Men 97, Episode 8, Tolerance is Extinction, Part 1, directed by Chase Conley and written by Bo DeMeo and Anthony Solidi. Cyclops, Gene, and Cable, aka the Summers, uncover the mystery of Bastion when they visit his childhood home and meet his mother. Jubilee and Roberto's shopping spree is interrupted by the activation of Mr. Sinister's humanoid zombie race of Sentinels, and Nightcrawler watches over Rogue as the walls of the X-Mansion crash down around them. Plus, the old boys return! Who's the old boys? Professor X and Magneto. Oh, okay. (laughs) The old boys. The old boys. I didn't know that's what they were called. The the gentlemen. Yeah. (laughs) The sirs. Baldy and Mr. Hare. Oh, Mr. Hare. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's set the stage for this episode. You want and to do the theme song? No. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of the theme song, Professor X is back in the credits. That's right. So he is there. Magneto. I mean, not Magneto. Well, yeah, he's not. He's not. <laughs> uh, neither is Gambit. So cool. Don't bring it up. <laughs> if I don't have to think about it, I don't want to. <laughs> Just a reminder for people. Three episodes ago, we lost our beloved <laughs> That was Gambit. three episodes ago? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> It feels just like yesterday. (laughs) So in this, we actually get uh, some time at the X mansion with Mm -hmm. some of our mutants, right? And the beginning of the episode actually answers some of the questions that we had. So it seems like Cable, one, got lost in the time stream with Bishop. Bishop had one job. (laughs) Lost the child. Yes. (laughs) It's slippery. Time, timey, wimey stuff. Very slippery. They, you know, this time stream technology, they just don't have it down yet. Yeah. And they're just still working through it. Even though he's from the future, the future still doesn't have it down. The techno virus that Mr. Sinister used on him was also used to create these prime sentinels of these humans. So it's all connecting Mr. Sinister's plot with Bastions and Master Mold and Trask and everybody else. It's all connecting. Yes. The very process that we saw infant Nathan go through in Sinister's lair is what they are now doing to humans everywhere. Right. A and little then, dip. Let's just talk about that for a second, right? So we find out in this episode that people willingly sign up for this program. Do they know, as Val asks, do they know the extent of it? Probably not, but they signed up for it. And it's particularly these people that like go into chat rooms that can speak freely, a particular type of person that doesn't like mutants mm. signed up for this program. So in this episode, we see people turning into these Prime Sentinels. One, Trish Tilby, also signed up for that program. That hot cocoa bitch. Raggedy bitch. (laughs) That just journalism vulture. I don't know where you were going to go with that. I didn't either, but that's where I landed. (laughs) I mean, it just shows you, too. It's like 
this episode really cemented that the X-Men have no buddy helping them. Yeah. You know, even Captain America is like, my hands are tied. Journalistic integrity, not helping. I mean, she, she was, she played on beasts emotions and was like, I'm just trying to show people like you guys are people too. Why'd you sign up for it? Trish. You just wanted to get into the lair at the X mansion so you could blow it up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was her plan. <laughs> well, that's what happened. <laughs> it's like she signed up for a secret club and it's all on blast. <laughs> exactly. I did think it was sort of funny, though, when Val is talking to Bastion, being like, do they even know what they're signing up for? When they look around, there's one guy convulsing on a table. There's another guy just like bending rebar over and over again. It's great. It's just like, that's what we need them for right now. Oh, yeah. They're just figuring out what they well, can they do. Well, they have to test their cybernetic strength. Sure. You know, they gotta- yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a gym. I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> a gym for the future's utopia. <laughs> yes, I do want to say, so as far as what, what Cable tells them, the rest of the X-Men, right, is that Morph says this thing of like, it's going to be a dystopia, the only other dystopia that, you know, Logan is going to survive. But he actually says it's a utopia. So they're not killing the mutants. They're basically enslaving them. Oh, no, no, no. Key word, he said, those that survived were so put they to were work. killing some. Yeah, right. They were put to work. Right. Which is great. It, yeah. They created a utopia for Not everybody for else. Mutants, right. Yes, for everybody else. You know, the mutants, it's very much damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. No matter who's coming for them, it just seems like they're going to end up being killed or enslaved or something horrible. Yeah, it's not OK. <laughs> well, no. And, and the, you know, that's the not the point, but that's why. They're always an allegory and it's, you know, conversations of bigotry and tolerance. Like they are resembling these groups of people and it's always going to happen, which yeah. is fun. It's an interesting thing, right? When you think about, you know, the mirror that it holds up to society in the sense that people are just constantly fighting for equality and for wanting things to be happier and more accepting. And there are other groups of people that are like, actually, no. Yeah, well, th- and th- I think this episode, so Bo DeMeo, since leaving, has been quite vocal on Twitter, especially with each episode, kind of telling him and stuff, because he's not doing interviews and stuff. And mm-hmm. that's a whole nother conversation, right? But he did say that Val, who is actually the original Jean Grey voice actress from the original, mm. is playing Val. And he said that she gives the season's thesis. And that's particularly in the conversation that she has with Bastion at the end, when mm-hmm. Bastion, when she freeze magneto she says because we always end up in the same ugly place most of us experience tragedies like genosha as a bit of deja vu before getting on with our day always end up in the same place it's 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 hard this episode i feel like is actually pretty dark even though we have some amazing moments which we will get to because wolverine and kurt oh my god Mm. so much to talk about but that's such a powerful thesis to have for something and i feel like You really understand these characters and you understand the themes that you're trying to say when this is what you're pushing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's sad, but I've never heard it put that way before. Like, it's like experiencing deja vu. Like, of course, this is going to happen. Everyday tragedies and everything. It's like, oh, hasn't this happened before? Probably. Yeah. And it's, it's really an interesting thought of how these things are happening right now in our world. But yet there are people in other places that just go on with their day normally. And especially when it doesn't affect them. Right. Exactly. I mean, just thinking from my own experience, the one thing that sort of was super close to home was 9-11, right? I grew up in New York. I was living here. And so that happened to us and we were living in it for quite a while. But now, you know, we, we, we remember it and the world was changed, but yet here we are living our normal lives, right? going in and out of the city, you know, even looking at COVID, right? It's, it's so interesting that these horrible things have happened in our history are currently happening now and yet here we are yeah and i think bo de had said that he thought a lot about 9 11 and the pulse nightclub mm. when doing this and it it comes off like that you know it's like the, he had something to say and the writers and everybody working on this and they're kind of using that as like a way to express this and to show this in a you know a more fictional way but it's very apparent especially in this episode i feel like it It's driving that home. And we still have two more episodes and I'm terrified. Yeah. So this episode really is, you know, there's never a a dull moment in X-Men. We're never just kind of delightfully watching them have an adventure. (laughs) There's always something really intense happening. Except for uh, Motendo. (laughs) Yes. Which was a half 
of an episode or like two thirds of an episode. Yeah. Um, but even the way this episode ends where you're kind of like, oh, maybe things will be okay for them. The fact that we have two more episodes of this, we know that something else is going to happen. Oh, yeah. And I feel like, you know, now that Professor X is back and Magneto is free, are we exactly where we started? I mean, no, but yes. <laughs> right? It's like these yeah. sort of two guys are back who represent very different ways of looking at solving problems and how was it going to go from here? I do want to talk about Professor X for a second because his eyebrows. No, oh. they're, they're a thing. It's <laughs> they grow that way. I love that for him. I wonder if he like pluck. Nah, anyway, that's a, <laughs> he was in space. Yeah, <laughs> he's always had those weird. Well, eye, it's, yeah. it's that's his psychic antenna. Yeah. <laughs> Without them, he cannot <laughs> that's put cerebro right. on. <laughs> that's the key. To yes. unlock. It scans the facial recognition. <laughs> so we had talked about kind of covering this episode or the series and we're like, do they know about him like being up there? Like what? Who knows what? Whatever. Um, and it seems very much like they did, at least in this episode. Nobody was surprised when Professor X was on TV. Nobody was surprised when he was alive. When they see him on TV, that's not why they're surprised. Wolverine turns to everybody after slashing the TV and is like, this is Bastion. It's like, oh, so you guys know. And it's weird that nobody's talking about it yet. I'm, I'm curious if we have to wait until he's actually physically with them. And then we'll get the backstory of what happened when he left. Right. Because there's that interesting moment when... You know, Scott spends a lot of time in Professor X's office just looking at that picture. He has big shoes to fill. <laughs> I guess so. And he says, I wish he would have taught me how to be a father before he left. Right? right? He doesn't say die. You know, he says left. So I guess they did know. Well, left could mean die. No, just <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it, it does seem like they had known this whole time. Yeah. Which is interesting. And I believe that when Sunspot's mother was to, Roberto's mother was talking and Jubilee had said something about like, we were trying to protect him from people like you. Mm -hmm. So there had to have been some type of agreement. And I'm really curious to see what that is. Just one little tiny mystery still left for this season. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was something that they felt he needed to leave in order to truly heal. Mm. And so if he was still there dealing with everything, he couldn't do that. Maybe. But it is interesting though. Still, I, uh, this is kind of my, my staking point with this whole thing is that his last will and testament was enacted and Magneto Oof. was brought in. He had to die. Right. So it's <laughs> like, so they were all faking his death together. Maybe. But it's kind of like at the same time, bringing Magneto in to lead seems hey, a little. Magneto was right. Is right. Magneto is right. <laughs> <laughs> Always was and will be right. He's going to trust his, his bestie though. Like, mm. and I feel like he tried. <laughs> Magneto got like one solid episode to try. And he was doing well. Well, that's the thing. I think that Magneto really was doing well and he was a good leader. But then humanity came back around again and pushed him back. Good job, humans. I mean, <laughs> that's a blanket <laughs> statement. <laughs> if sarcasm. Speaking of healing, I want to talk about Jean a little bit in this episode. She doesn't have many parts, but she does have a conversation with Kurt um, when they're kind of nursing Rogue back to health. Rogue is like out. For this episode, Storm is nowhere to be found. I want everybody back together because from that first episode to now, I'm just missing all of them together. Yeah. But Kurt and her have a conversation and we find out that Jean's, that Madeline's memories feel like Jean's. Like she feels like they're hers. And that's confusing. Mm -hmm. Like she talks about how she, the first cry, how it felt to hold Nathan, all of these things. And like in her death, she felt everything. So to have those all muddled up and confusing, but Kurt being the amazing, amazing person he is, he, to, sum, to summarize his conversation, he talks about blood is blood and family is a choice. So you can choose to be somebody that welcomes him into your family because he's here. Mm. Cable is here. Nathan's here. Mm. Doesn't have his mother anymore, even though you're part of it. What are you going to do? So... I love that conversation a lot. I agree. And I think, I mean, looking at the very sort of technical side of it is that like Madeline was a clone of Gene. It's the same DNA. He has your DNA. You, if they did a maternity test, you would be his mother. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, there's that if, to, if, if that's not enough for her, but I love Kurt's conversation and telling him his own experience of found family and saying, 
when my family rejected me because I was too blue and Rogue's mother, you know, screwed her, her over, we found each other. Right. And we created that bond together. He's like, so if two people who aren't even related in any way can make a family, you are related to him. So, of course, you're his mother. In a weird X-Men way. <laughs> yes. And I think that's fine. I mean, when her, her clone called herself the Goblin Queen. So yeah. I think that we could take that leap in saying yeah. she is her mother. And I love that by the end of the episode, she's doing things like putting a seatbelt on him. I love when she's told him to put a seatbelt on and then she's like, Nathan, get in the back. He's like, stop bossing me around. <laughs> it just needed that extra mom. Mom. <laughs> yeah. It felt very like. The summers do have a little mini vacation, terrifying as it is, mm. but it was really fun to see them together working as a unit. I even like, right, so they do go to, the last trace they have of Bastion is in his neighborhood in Pennsylvania where he grew up, and they meet his mother. So they're looking at, a, you know, the representation of, like, you know, a biological mother, and it's fucked up. Right. He used his mom. As part of his experiment, you know what I mean? So it's like, if that's what a real family is, it's a mess. Why right. can't we be a family? Right. Yeah. I mean, well, and found family is a very big thing in X-Men, right? Because the X-Men are a found family. They decided to come together and they welcome more people in when they need it. Um, so it's a beautiful thing that we're still seeing it evolve in, in its various ways that it does represent itself. You know, clone can mother the son of your clone <laughs> you know it could be a thing who knows let's see how that goes but the the outing was a lot of fun i like seeing them together to see how they work yeah we got to see them fighting on the ground fighting the air fighting in a car i mean striking poses it was incredible <laughs> the whole scene with um so when the sentinels like activate and everything and the terrifying bastion mother uh did not like that one bit she was scary whenever you hear bones cracking that's never a good sign it's never good <laughs> but the fact that they have a porsche just in the x-wing <laughs> third x-wing that they've destroyed maybe the third porsche that they've destroyed right, true <laughs> i like how beast is just like making x-wings but also making a porsche to go with them. yeah whoever his uh you know what is it the black hawk is that what it's called what is it called blackbird yeah yeah um whenever he calls his person he's like I need another one. We destroyed it. Oh, no, that's him building it. Like, oh, by hand. <laughs> Poor beast. He's dealing with Trish knocking on his door. He's building these planes and cars, and they just keep destroying it. That um, superhero landing of all three of them after the Porsche explodes and Gene, like, sets them down easy. So good. So good. Family entrance. What has Cable been through that this is a normal family outing he's for like, him? This is fun. Yeah. He's like, woohoo, let's go. <laughs> In this scene, so what did you make of Bastion's backstory? So it's really interesting, right? I think there were a lot of details to kind of follow. So what I was he a mutant before, or was he only get his powers because the virus went into his father? Yeah. Right. So um I think it was really interesting that he had no choice in mm -hmm. any of this. And he was raised to really to be this, to be this sort of kind of interesting culmination of all of this sentinel technology coming together. Yeah, he's a descendant of all the sentinels. And it's it's an interesting thing because it does seem like he had a nurturing household mm. of some sort. I mean, we didn't really see any abuse or anything like that, but it did seem like his mother kind of like let him do whatever he wanted to do. And there was none of that, like not stopping who they are, but like maybe pointing in the right direction. But he is a descendant of Nimrod. Mm -hmm. So it's like, would he even have a choice well, in anything? Right. And I think that brings up another conversation of nature versus nurture. He says, I was born this way. He's on the right, right <laughs> thing. Uh, opposite. So I, I think it's interesting, right? Even though his mother was there and loving and supportive and was telling him that he is beautiful no matter what he's experiencing, he still became this. So far we know. I mean, she agreed to be in that program, maybe, unless he forced her to be. Well, she thought that they were the people from the home yeah. picking her up a day early. <laughs> so I don't did. think she was all there, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Bastion. It is an interesting mirror to put up, right? Because he went through the same things that a normal mutant would go through. And he's deciding to not help the same group of people that he's going through. He's just like, nope, they need to go away because we need to make humanity better. Was it his technological programming that he had no control over? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Descendant of Nimrod, I'm going to say yes, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> this is my father, Nimrod. <laughs> when your dad's name is Nimrod, 
It's like, never going to go well. I wouldn't say dad. That's <laughs> grandfather. <laughs> Sperm donor. Tiny, tiny, white me. You know? Okay. Yeah. I'll, don't try and figure out the family tree, I guess. So at the X mansion, let's talk about this fight between Kurt and Wolverine and all these prime sentinels. What's sexier <laughs> than two burly dudes fighting with six blades? Adding three more. <laughs> our boy finally gets his three swords. Love it. Um, both of our boys get their moment, right? Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are like, when is Wolverine getting his moment? This was a moment for him. Him going up in the air and then doing like a claw tornado down and just slicing all these people up. So good. How about when Trish is blasting him into the night sky and he's taking his claws and just jamming it into her back and nothing is happening Nothing's stopping Trish from getting a scoop. (laughs) But then he flies back down like a meteor and then comes through swinging. I mean, nothing is stopping our dear Logan here. (sighs) And then having uh, the rotating camera scene. I love. Yeah. I love a rotating camera scene, especially an action sequence. And having Wolverine and Kurt both fighting, bamfing around. And then we get something that I never, never knew I needed in my life. As an X-Men fan, as a human, as a Nightcrawler fan, um, going inside of a Banff. Oh. Oh. And I love, you know, this is just normal everyday life for Kurt. For Logan, his face is like, uh, 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 like yeah. he does not know what's going on. It is so cool. Yeah. I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. Of course. Like, and it's so cool because it just shows that like, you know, we, we see Nightcrawler and he appears and disappears and all of that. And we think it's like instantaneous, but like. It is, but to see that he has a motion of what he does and it's like he's doing it in a direction, mm. it's just really, really cool. I want to know more. I want, I want, I want to go inside of one again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it's really exciting to be in that power. I think so often we are watching the powers, but we're not actually experiencing them. Experiencing them and I thought that was like kind of mind-blowing, yeah. something you've never thought of. What would it be like to be in there? So cool. It was so cool. I really hope we get to see it again. You know, I think the X-Men really needed Kurt for a number of reasons. Everybody needs Kurt. (laughs) He's just like the, he's just like so emotionally intelligent and also awesome. Yeah. So, you know, he, his, he, his spot there needed to be filled and he did. Well, and I'm glad that they recognize that right it's like he deserved to be on the title card he deserved to always be on the team constantly i mean he is in the comics right he does pop in and out um but i love him on the team because he does bring that added layer of spirituality the Mm -hmm. person that is always going to be able to talk to you openly every single person that he's had a moment with has opened up to him and I love that about him. Yeah, what's what's so great about this character in particular is that he he has history with them, right? Especially with Rogue we see in this episode. So there's depth there. He's not just some interloper that's come in one day. He really is just a friend. So well, they it makes know, sense. They know that they can talk to him, yes. which is fantastic. Yeah. Ah. I love him. I know. Well, he is one of your favorites. He is like top three favorites. Yeah. Let's talk about my favorite, Storm. We can't because she was not in this episode. <laughs> she did show up at the very end. Yes. she. That <laughs> end part was very much when on a, a, an issue of a comic, their little faces are in the corner with the mm-hmm. issue number and the date. I love that. Yeah. It's just Xavier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about um, Jubilee and Sunspot. Let's just talk about their whole thing that happens in this i really want i love jubilee i like sunspot um i don't have any real connection with him or anything i think he's cool and i think his powers look awesome um i'm i want some good stuff for jubilee it is interesting the story that they keep putting her in right it's like she's around roberto when he's going through that really new mutant stuff right and I think it's important to see that. I just think it's interesting that Jubilee's attached to it. Maybe because it's like, is she going to be able to stand up to the wave of Prime Sentinels? She probably could. But it's interesting to see them together this whole time. And they're not like separating them. Yeah, this seems, again, very much what we've been talking about. Jubilee kind of being the veteran now in this situation. And I think that we see this, that she's truly coming to her own, especially with how she speaks to people, right? Whereas. In the original series, she was very much spoken to and being taught things. But 
even at breakfast with Roberto's mother, she's not afraid to stand up and speak her mind and be like, let's get out of here. And she's like, mm, no, thanks. Yeah. And so this evolution of Jubilee, I, I wish she would come into her powers more with that strength. It's interesting. It seems like Roberto has figured out some new things about the way his powers work now that he can fly and Jubilee still doesn't. No. Yeah, I she I feel like she will. You know, we have she did get a new outfit, which is amazing. Um, and that outfit what store in the mall did she get that outfit from? No idea. <laughs> a sleek black bodysuit with a purple turtleneck. Yes. <laughs> Luckily, it went with her earrings and yeah. the yellow coat. <laughs> um, that is a costume that she has had in the comics. It's like dark jubilee. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll see if that translates or it's just like a nod to it. I do appreciate their stories, though, right? So we see how awful Roberto's mom is. We see that she wants to throw a fundraiser for the people in Genosha. It's like, yeah, to to people's faces, you're going to act like you support them, but you just told your son to be discreet about who he is. Right. And then when you are having the fundraiser and he needs your help as a mother and there's people around, nobody goes and helps the children. And he's like, I need your help. And then they pose as like, oh, we we help mutants. This is what we're supposed to do. And she's like, go with them. Yeah. Ugh, not even protecting your child. She's letting him be carted away to basically a conversion camp, you know. And so she looks around at everybody before yeah, she makes that decision. All the eyes judging her and she can't handle that. So she'd rather give her son up than protect him. Such a bitch. <laughs> Such a bitch. But I said it. So <laughs> real. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And. Now, I'm curious about what this means for Jubilee and Roberto, who have now been taken captive Not by good. these prime sentinels. Yeah. You know, so speaking of this sort of dark Jubilee storyline, are some awful things going to happen to them that's really going to strip her of her childhood joy and push her into being an adult even more so? Yeah, probably. I mean, I think even just witnessing for Roberto, seeing like, oh, his mom is not going to help him at all. Like you were still there pretending and being at breakfast with each other. And at the drop of the hat, if it push came to shove, she's like, no, right. You need to go. Whatever is going to help you be normal. You need to go do that. (sighs) What are the moments after they're taken away? She's like, okay, everyone have fun. Right. Exactly. Let's get this party started. Don't mind the hole, the hole in the wall. We're just going to sweep that up. (laughs) Stupid. Sweep it under the rug. I did like, though, that like the way this episode was set up, it's like everybody's finding sentinels and like there's a lot of stuff going on in Jubilee and Roberto are like treating themselves. Mm. She's like, you got a trust fund, baby. Let's go shopping. (laughs) Speaking of clothes or lack of clothes, our boy Magneto. What's he doing in those skivvies? There's a cup. Okay. I have (laughs) questions. I want to hear them. I I was very appreciative. Yeah. Um, Great body. (laughs) They said. You're going to love these silver daddies. Well, well, so the last time we saw him, he was getting a nice shave by Bastion. And the next time we see him, he's clothesless. He just has briefs on. So like Bastion. Yeah. I think, I think Bastion <laughs> may have some kinks that we don't know about, <laughs> particularly tying people up and shaving them and then stripping them of their clothing. I love how there's a meme going around where it's like Magneto cosplay and it's just a white wig with black briefs. Yeah, that's <laughs> if, how you're going to Comic-Con. I was going to say, if I don't see somebody at Comic-Con this year cosplaying as that, very upset. It's going to happen. It's 100% going to happen. <laughs> there is three different looks, maybe four, of just Magneto alone that people can do. Yeah. And if that's not one of them, upset. It really has to be. And I think, you know, maybe... Because you're, you know, I mean, you're going to be in Javits, so you might as well put on the boots and the opera length gloves. Yeah. Right? With the briefs. With the briefs. Just yeah. mesh all of them yeah. together. <laughs> but he's doing total silent treatment. He's not giving anyone anything. And Val, you know, comes around after really seeing what Bastion's plan is. Well, and, she didn't know. Right. Well, oh, and that's even a, another thing to talk about is sort of this like group of doom that okay. Bastion has put together. I'm just going to name the cameos that are in this episode, which are like, I love this type of cameo, right? Where it's just quick. It makes sense. Whatever. Because um, a lot of these people have already shown up in the show, but it was nice to see that they s- still exist. So we got Doom, who is like, you know, don't think that my cooperation is, like agrees with these war crimes. Just putting it out there. I rule Latvia. So like, we can't we can't do that. So Doom, I love it. I love him so much. 
Then we get Zemo, comic accurate. Yes. Baron Zemo. Amazing. Silver Samurai, who is a Wolverine main adversary. Omega Red, another Wolverine main adversary. Uh He's scary. Yeah. And he's the only one out of these cameos where I'm like, he could potentially be somebody playing a part in season two because the fact that he is going to be out of his stasis is not a good thing. Well, it it does seem like, right, if if this does go where Professor X and Magneto are butting heads again, Magneto is going to have to put the team together. Maybe. Uh, no. Right. Okay. No, we're not doing that. I don't want him to do a Brotherhood of Evil mutants. Like, they no. still are running at each other in the opening credits of this show. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They are not shaking hands. No. Politely. I want them. Maybe Magneto didn't know that Xavier was alive. Okay. Twist. That could create some issues. Charles, <laughs> you did not um, respond to any of my emails. I'm not done with the cameos. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Spider Man. We got animated series Spider-Man, which makes sense that he is around. He did show up in the show. Um, And then there was one more. I don't know if it was Madame Mask Mm. or not. It could be Fontaine. It could be, I don't know. But why did they do that, do you think? Maybe for this. (laughs) For us to talk about? They specifically knew a bite of movies and TV. Derek and Noah are going to question. We're on everyone's radar. (laughs) Bo DeMeo knew. We are. (laughs) For sure. Because he knows we love a strong female character, and he did not want to tell us who it was. He didn't show us her face. Bo. But those are fantastic cameos. Yeah. Dr. Doom, just seeing him, just made me like, oh, we're getting the Fantastic Four soon. Mm. Guys, I'm going to be insufferable <laughs> with the Fantastic Four. Going to be. <laughs> <laughs> if you could see this part, those that are watching this, if you could see this part, they're always behind me. Yes. They're always displayed on the Watching wall. Watching over him, and, and Mr. Fantastic is always judging me. <laughs> He's always looking right at me. <laughs> so back to, back to the room with Val and Magneto. I thought it was really powerful. I, I thought it was, you know, the shot where it shows the tattoo of the numbers on his arm, him not talking, but also her explaining, like, I didn't know that this was happening, right? And her, in a way, even though she was on, I was going to say Baron Zemo's side, on Bastion's side, she is sympathizing a little bit because she was there experiencing Mm. she was on the other end of this of what's happening to the mutants i guess my question is what did these like what did dr doom what did val what did they think bastion was doing that they were like okay well i mean i don't think he told them they're just like they're evil okay evil guy yeah it's like a group chat like they're just like Hey, what do you guys think about this? They're on this? WhatsApp? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's like, what do you guys think about this world do- dominating plan? No, I already tried that. You know, that kind of thing. I like that line where he's like, well, all the people before me have been failing since 92. Yeah. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> it's been a five years of nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about that bastion. <laughs> but this episode ending with one Val's speech and talking to Bastion, but seeing Magneto go up, come down, and then just doing a worldwide EMP, Mm. taking out all the Prime Sentinels, probably taking out some commercial airliners. Um, If everything... Shutting down power plants. ...is gone. Yeah. He really did declare war. Not even just on Bastion, but like he openly declared war on everybody that is either turning a blind eye or not supporting them, but on the world. Because got, he took out everything. Yeah. I mean, I got to say again, very much like when I was siding with Rogue in the last episode, I'm kind of with Magneto on oh, this one. <laughs> I, yes, I support their wrongs. Do I think there's going to be huge ramifications for this? Yes. Yeah. But, you know, I, who was the one that said it in this episode? Oh, Wolverine, whenever it was towards the end and... More fans him a, a beer because he knows what his, his boy likes to drink. Um, but he said, Magneto really did it. And he's like, oh, what? Saved our butts? And he's like, no, declared war. Yeah. is going to be really interesting. And now Professor Xavier's back. Yeah. So what is that going to look like? So that could be the conflict that's going to happen. Professor X, there's a difference between fashionably late and just late. <laughs> you were late. He said, this bitch. <laughs> He said, I'm going to take off my little insect helmet. Look, I, I like Professor X. I think that his ideals and 
what he's done to raise some of these kids is fantastic. And he wanted to have a home for all these people. I'm just trying to butter it up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you are late. I'm sorry. Like he, <laughs> there should have been a quicker way. Like you should have known something was still going to happen. Like mutant human relations were not good yeah. when you left. There should have been like an instant teleport. Like, do, do I know what he could have done? I don't know. I mean, but like with, with his freaking brain waves, he couldn't just like push his ship a little more. He's lucky he made it through Magneto's freaking EMP. That's probably why he crashed. Well, he deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take that bug man. <laughs> yeah. Into the wreckage of his house. Oh, that was kind of sad. He'll build again. Seeing the X-Mansion like completely destroyed. Yeah. But luckily Ooh. our X-Men are alive. Yeah. You know, sans gambit. I did like when he was like, to me, my X-Men, the X-Men it did show were interesting, but it's like, is it just like all the smart ones? Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Beast did have his glasses on. He did. <laughs> and Storm was like, hi. <laughs> Question. Where was she? Right. And like, does like Forge's arm and leg break down due to this EMP nonsense? I don't know. I don't think so. No? I don't think it's like electrical. I don't know. We'll I see. Don't know. Yeah, I, I guess. guess we'll see. Maybe he, I mean, he'll think of something that's <laughs> yeah. just like his deal. Yeah. But he'll I am fine. curious to see what the ramifications are with this, right? Is it, is it an EMP where it takes it out for a little bit? I'm not a scientist. I'm not an EMP specialist. Like, does it always nullify it? Or is it like it just. Right. How long are the prime sentinels down for? Well, my main point, though, is if it completely destroys it, like it mm -hmm. doesn't work. That means the electrical stuff in the world doesn't work. So hospitals and, yeah. you know, if listen, ugh. if we know our boy Magneto, are they in the prehistoric times now? <laughs> oh, are we doing that again? <laughs> didn't, didn't they go to like some land with dinosaurs at some point? The savage land. There you go. It's amazing. Yeah. Again, my seven year old brain really didn't know what was going on in the moment. I'm like dinosaurs. Uh, he can walk now. Um, but it, our boy Magneto definitely knows exactly what he's doing. I think he could pull it back and push it forward as much as he wants. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I guess we'll see. You know what? One thing we didn't talk about, which I think is very important. What? The prime sentinel tongues. Uh, yeah, they're pretty strong. Like, uh, I don't know. What? Yeah. Why not? I'm, I'm not I'm not saying it's bad. It's also terrifying that they essentially have like a healing factor where after Wolverine and Kurt slice them up, we just put themselves back together. Yeah, that lady's hand was like, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, it's not not good. So we're in a bit of a pickle, right? <laughs> Things are not good because there are just millions of these prime sentinels being activated. But Magneto has also shut them down. So where do we go from here? Yeah, I, I feel like Bastion must have something up their sleeves. It is. It's interesting. I'm glad that we did also get the answer of why Cable can't just like fix everything. I like that. I'm, I'm happy now. I am sad that it's like you can't just save Gambit, but I'm happy because we got an answer. It's like the Watcher was there. So that's never a good sign. That means like it's an event to watch. It's an absolute point and he can't. He's tried countless times and yeah. he just can't save his mother or genosha so <laughs> yeah we're just we're we're slowly but surely figuring out the time travel rules of x-men i'm curious and this, this is one of them this is like one of the like i'm crazy right this is like a crazy theory <laughs> i should have said this is a crazy theory not i'm crazy i'm crazy but people might think i am crazy after this mm. so i've you know they've done events that are kind of skipping around the x-men timeline right and I'm curious if I don't know Bo DeMeo or their feeling on the Krakoa era of X-Men, but like X-Mansion's down, X-Men need a place to go. What if they like somehow were able to like do the resurrection protocols from X-Men and bring back some of their fallen X-Men? I don't know. That's just I'm just curious if they could do that. I don't know. Well, I will admit you were just talking about a lot of things that are comic X-Men. Yeah. And not to us regular lay people. So <laughs> I'm not going to get fully into it. Krakoa is an island that the X-Men go to. It becomes a nation. It, it's like Genosha almost. And is that where that ball happens? Yes. Golden balls. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, no. The Hellfire. The, the Gallic. The Gallic. Hellfire Gallic. Yeah. I thought you meant golden balls. Like the X-Men that literally makes golden balls. 
Oh, I remember you telling me about that. Yeah. So there's five X-Men that with their powers combined, they can resurrect X-Men. So that's like the whole, these last couple of years, the Krakoa era of X-Men are, they're pretty much immortal. It's like, there's been stories where they all die, but they come back because uh, Professor X can store them inside of like Cerebro and then put them into the bodies that are made from, it's a whole big thing, right? It's, it's a lot. He has it saved on a USB stick. But I don't know. I mean, at this point, I think Gambit's like dead, dead. No. I don't think he's coming back, guys. Man. I don't know. Fully disagree. Just because I don't want that to be the truth. I know. <laughs> Sometimes our heroes have to fall in order to push the rest of the heroes forward. <laughs> I mean, it is a big point. You know, it's like that's going to be a thing that like pushes a lot of the characters. I don't know. Avenging. It's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So next week. Part two. We have part two of three. So let us know your thoughts. Let us know what you're excited for, what you're not excited for. abonibbles at gmail.com. You can do it there. Send us your stuff, your thoughts. Ugh. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Part two. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>